Hey everybody, welcome to For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and the planet. My name is Matteo DeVos, and without further ado, let's talk about food. Hey everybody, welcome back to the For Food's Sake podcast. You might have noticed that it's been a while since I released the last episode, but I do have a good excuse. I'm very excited to announce that I'm currently working on a documentary called The Original Foodies. It's a documentary series that will explore what it takes to farm today by sharing the stories of farmers that are determined to beat the odds and do things better and more sustainably. So over the coming months, we'll be releasing uh, portraits of farmers And you can follow all of those developments and everything we're up to. Uh, We're currently filming, actually. I'm going to the UK tomorrow to film the second episode. So you can follow everything that we're up to on the social media handles. Um, On Facebook, that's the original foodies doc, D-O-C, from Documentary. It's the same on Instagram. And on Twitter, which we're currently making, it will be a little different. It will be T-O-F, so that stands for the original foodies documentary. Now, that's all I'll say for now about the documentary. Uh, We will probably be releasing an episode on the For Food's Sake podcast, explaining a little bit more in detail about what the documentary is all about. Um, But let's move on to this week's episode, where we talk with Patrick Holden about the hopes and fears of British farming after Brexit. Now, Patrick is a real pioneer of the modern sustainable food movement. He was the founding chairman of British Organic Farmers in 1982, And he's also the former director of the UK Soil Association, where he played a key role in the development of organic standards and the market for organic foods in the UK for nearly 20 years. And he's also the founding director and the current chief executive of the Sustainable Food Trust, which is an organization that's dedicated to accelerating the transition to more sustainable food and farming systems. And just to top things off, he also happens to run the longest established dairy farm in Wales, and he wrote the world's first draft of the organic dairy standards in the 80s. It was a real pleasure talking to Patrick, and so without further ado, here he is. I bring you Patrick Holden. Patrick Holden, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Great. It's a pleasure to uh, speak with you. So I'd like to uh, take this time that we have together, as I I mentioned uh, earlier as we were talking, to talk about the UK government's post-Brexit plan for agriculture, um, which is outlined in the Health and Harmony paper uh, from the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, which is commonly referred to as DEFRA. And I'd like to really uh, dive into some of your opinions on this paper and also the um, some of the common responses. But before we do that, I'm, I'm very curious to know more and, and hear more about the the general mood currently in in Britain, specifically amongst farmers and agronomists and the food industry more general, uh, as Brexit approaches and how Brexit might impact agriculture? Yes, well, um, I am a Remainer, and I was pretty uh, shocked and depressed when I heard the outcome of the referendum, particularly in relation to how farmers had voted, um, because uh, quite a significant I think majority of them did vote for Brexit. I always thought that was like Turkey's voting for Christmas, which seems an appropriate metaphor. <laughs> um, and uh, because it would, it was pretty clear to me, especially farming as I am um, in a um, objective one part of the United Kingdom, namely West Wales, where we've been huge beneficiaries of the EU. Um, once we once Brexit is over, or if Brexit happens, I should probably say, um, we're not going to get the level of support that we've enjoyed historically. So um, I think most many farmers, probably the ones who voted for Brexit, are privately having doubts about whether they did the right thing. And I think it would be true to say that the mood in British agriculture at the moment is uh, nervous because nobody really knows what's going to happen next. And there are a few kind of, um, you know, exuberant optimists who think, oh, it's all going to be fine when we're just trading on world markets and Britain can produce more 
food at lower prices and we can we're liberated from the tyranny of the EU and all that sort of thing. But a lot more people who I think are pretty deeply worried about what's going to happen next and possibly the only um, ray of sunshine, potential sunshine on the horizon is the um, uh, the DEFRA Health and Harmony paper that you mentioned, which has been really conceived by Michael Gove, our DEFRA Secretary of State. Right. So, so before we get into this 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 paper, I, I think, um, as you mentioned, there's a sense of uh, there's definitely nervousness, and 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 maybe that paper is a sense of optimism. But but one thing that struck me in in particular in your response uh, to that paper is that you talk in your introduction about moving away from the current orthodoxy of greening the edges and of farming that doesn't uh, take care of the negative externalities and that the UK really needs an approach to food production that's integrated and that works in in harmony with nature. Um, Could you talk a little bit about your general approach, where you think post-Brexit farming should go before we go into the paper further? Uh, yes, I could. But just to be clear in what I'm about to say, I don't blame the European Union or the Common Agricultural Policy for having made that brought about that separation, which I think uh, has happened all over the world. Um, and when I say that, I mean that um, long ago, when I was a boy back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, my I lived in and around the London area, but my father, who was training to be a doctor, moved around a lot. So we ended up um, in various places, including one um, small village uh, in Hertfordshire, uh, where there was still a, a traditional farming system going on with a rotation and hardly any use of chemicals. This is actually 1957, 1958. And I spent the most idyllic year um, collecting bird's eggs, which you know, was legal then and catching butterflies and mounting them on a board and just really experiencing farming in harmony with nature, coexisting with the most incredible abundance of biodiversity, which wasn't planned in a sort of stewardship scheme. It was just happened because uh, the farmers were not using methods which are aggressive towards wildlife. Um, And since that time, and accelerate at an accelerating rate, particularly since the 80s and the 90s, when not only was there widely available nitrogen fertilizer, but also pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, in other words, the chemistry to control uh, the, the pest um, diseases and weeds, which coexist with high levels of nitrogen fertilizer. We've decimated our wildlife. And then along came the so-called pillar two um, policymakers. And they said, well, let's incentivize farmers to farm uh, around the edges of otherwise intensively managed land for uh, nature outcomes which have been uh, eliminated through uh, industrial farming. And so really over the last 15, 20 years and more, uh, most farmers have confined their um, work on looking after nature uh, to maybe 5 or 10 percent of their land and the rest of the land has more or less become a desert. And I think it's time that changed because I know from my own experience here on this farm that you can produce um, encouragingly good yields of crops, whilst at the same time uh, you can see in the understory of the crops or the grassland that feed our ca- that feeds our cows um, an amazing diversity of um, below the soil life, but also above the soil insect life, weeds, so-called weeds plants which aren't sown, and um, further above in the food chain, again, birds, small mammals, etc., which can coexist with food production. And I believe that the future of agriculture has to reintegrate nature conservation and food production in ways that are similar to uh, what we are doing here at scale, because otherwise we're going to have a planet which isn't fit to inhabit possibly sooner than we think. I I really like your point about the fact that Agriculture shouldn't be seen as something that's done in, let's say, isolated spots where conservation is done, you know, on the outside of that, but that they should very much work kind of integrated together. And I think this brings uh, us on nicely to to the Health and Harmony paper, where, you know, one of the first major points of this paper is about phasing out pillar one payments of the common agricultural policy in favor of a new 
environmental land management system. Could you unpack that a little bit? And maybe for listeners that are not so familiar, briefly, just briefly explain what the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 payments are before explaining maybe some of the problems that you see with this new environmental land management system. Okay, well, I'll describe the situation in the UK right now as far as um, receipt of um, taxpayers' money is concerned. If you're a farmer, uh, we get something over a hundred pounds an acre, sorry to speak in acres, whatever that is, 240, 50 pounds a hectare, uh, really most of which we get for uh, not breaking the law. Uh, 80% of it is get is a sort of social security payment for farmers paid on an area basis. So let's say we get about 80 pounds an acre per year for that. And in order to qualify it, we just simply need to have the land, have a license to farm and not practice any environmental vandalism, then you get it. The other 20%, which is the so-called pillar two payments, um, to get those, you have to do specifically environmentally friendly management practices. It might be organic farming. We're organic farming here. So we get um, area payments each year for organic farming. But it could be um, uh, a scheme which encourages uh, beetles or insects or wildflower strips uh, where we would have to show that we are doing something particular to get the money or maybe just managing habitat which is wet um, or encouraging wildflowers by not cutting um, until after the 15th of July, that sort of thing. Now, in my view, this separation between the Pillar 1 and the Pillar 2, 80% for Pillar 1 just for farming and Pillar 2 for doing environmental things around the edges, has had the effect of separating an understanding about nature from food not only physically on the farm, but also structurally within the uh, European Union and actually in the minds of the public. So the public no longer associate food production and nature as going in harmony. And that's a terrible thing because it's, it will affect future generations' understanding about the possibility of doing both at the same time. And the opportunity of Brexit, if you can call it that, is that because we can sort of throw away the old... EU pillar one, pillar two structures, we can then rewrite the policy um, framework in such a way that we could reintegrate those two practices. Now, having said that, to be honest, uh, previous governments in the United Kingdom have probably been the most philistine in encouraging intensive farming practices. So it is a bit rich in some ways for our present government to say, you know, now we are leaving the EU, we can do better. Because in fact, it was the United Kingdom government that prevented the greening of the cap uh, in previous administrations. But let's put that on one side, because we happen to have a minister or a secretary of state, namely Michael Gove, who, for reasons which I don't fully understand, seems to be pretty enlightened about agriculture, but also very radical. So he has set out in principled terms in the Harmony Health and Harmony um, consultation paper, uh, a vision for agriculture, which does indeed reintegrate food production with nature conservation. But of course, the devil will, will be in the detail, and there's not much detail in that document. So now we, the Sustainable Food Trust, and many other organizations are lobbying and encouraging in every way that we possibly can uh, the flesh of the reform policy package uh, to deliver just that, a more integrated uh, production and nature conservation picture. And luckily, we seem to have quite a lot of influence on DEFRA. Um, I have pre quite frequent contact with Michael Gove, and four DEFRA officials came to a farm walk that we organised last week. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we will have an influence, but it won't be until we see the actual details of the policy incentives, it's all still to play for. But also, as... as uh, Minet Batters, the president of the National Farmers Union, mentioned at the Future of UK Farming Conference back in April, if anything is going to throw farming's future under the wheels of the bus, it will be trade deals. Could you talk a little bit about trade deals and how trade deals could potentially derail all of DEFRA's well intentions? Yes, I'm happy to do that. But before I come to that, maybe I should say that at the moment, uh, the most profitable way to farm uh, is using methods quite quite intensive methods uh, which produce lots of food but uh, which also cause damage to the environment and public health. Um, let me explain a bit more about what I mean. If a farmer uses 
uh, nitrogen fertilizer, it probably has a, a, a return of threefold of every pound invested in nitrogen fertilizer. You might get three pounds worth of crop growth as sold. But unfortunately, at the same time, there are a lot of nitrous oxide emissions, both during the manufacture of that fertilizer when, and when it's put on the land. Plus, a lot of the nitrate doesn't get into the crop. It goes into the drinking water and water companies have to strip that out. And it affects air quality um, and diminishes soil biodiversity. But none of those costs um, are paid for by the farmer or the fertilizer company. So it has the use of nitrogen fertilizer is profitable, even though if you factored in all those costs and made farmers pay for them in the form of a polluter pays tax, it would probably wipe out the business case for using it. So if Michael Gove was to bring in a polluter pays tax, for instance, and tax nitrogen fertilizer and redirect the pillar one payments and make them conditional on adopting farming practices which delivered public goods, then the WTO might say, or the British government may say, that by making farmers, by forcing farmers to be financially accountable for their so-called negative externalities, mean, meaning the damaging consequences of their farming practices, we will be disadvantaged on international markets. And our international um, trade secretary, Liam Fox, is a bit of an unreconstructed world trader character, very different from Michael Gove. He may well think that if Michael Gove succeeds in getting his way, he's going to make British farmers less competitive on world markets. So there is a real tension there. What Gove is saying is that if farmers farm to higher standards, then we could erect a trade barrier saying well, you cannot import your chlorinated chicken or um, food produced in ways which are, is causing damage to the environment because we are only going to accept your products if they conform to minimum environmental standards. But that is all to play for yet, particularly in relation to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, who may not like that kind of a deal. You mentioned the polluters pay principle. Uh, I think one of the interesting points that, that maybe we should discuss a little further about this principle is that although the, it's clear there are many negative externalities of farming, a lot of them are hard to measure. How do we overcome the barrier here um, of, of measuring something that's very hard to measure? Well, I think actually in terms of the damage to the environment and so-called natural capital, which is becoming a great buzzword now, there's quite a lot of data out there which would enable a government to be able to incentivize farmers for delivering uh, increased natural capital or avoiding pollution and uh, tax them when they cause that pollution. Just to give the nitrogen example again, the European Nitrogen Assessment uh, did a lot of work on this. A couple of hundred scientists were involved and they did quantify and monetize the impact of the use of nitrogen fertilizer. So it would be perfectly feasible for Michael Go to introduce a nitrogen tax using the data from the European Nitrogen Assessment as his guide to how much he could ju uh, justify the level of tax he set. What is, however, more difficult is to quantify and monetize the impact on public health. It's very clear that modern intensive farming is causing damage to public health. Um, you only have to look at the growing incidence of obesity, diabetes, cancer, um, diseases of the immune system, uh, and conclude that at least in part, the causes of these huge, very costly epidemics are in part due to changes in farming practice. But what is not so clear is how much of it is due to changes before the farm gate and how much of it is to do with food processing. But in my opinion, which needs to be stacked up by good science, um, the changes in farming practice which have happened during my lifetime have dramatically reduce the nutrient density of food, especially trace element min and minerals, for instance, plus the use of pesticides, um, Roundup, of course, is one of them, but the organophosphates, um, which are in a lot of different pesticides, um, they are almost certainly responsible, a contributory factor to the increase in cancers. And if one could monetize the impact on public health and argue that if 
DEFRA introduced policies which uh, persuaded farmers to use less intensive methods, and by doing so, they would save bills on the NHS. This would be huge because the NHS is threatening to bankrupt our economy, as, of course, its equivalent is in other countries throughout the world. So, yes, you're right. The costs are not easy to quantify, but on the other hand, they're so vast that we need to quantify them and we need to do something about them. I'd like to to switch focus here a little bit now and, and, and focus on the on the farm workers, especially uh, recently in the news, seasonal EU migrant workers that are leaving the UK um, and, and some of the impacts that that might have of agriculture in the UK relying on especially fruit farms here on, on such labor. W- what do you think the prospects are for a post-Brexit uh, situation regarding to, to migrant workers? Well, um, just to say, um, we used to be carrot growers on this farm. We used to grow organic carrots for most of the supermarkets. And over the years, we employed um, children from local schools during the holidays. They were great, actually. And quite a lot of um, adults now in our area have memories of carrot weeding on our farm and harvesting. And I know this, it's very um, un-PC now to talk about child <laughs> labor, but actually... I think there's nothing like good physical work on farms for training the body and the mind of young children rather than just sitting on iPads and stuff. But that's a, another point. <laughs> but what I did notice when we had Eastern European um, economic migrants effectively here harvesting our carrots is they had a fantastic work ethic, so much better than, you know, the young people in our, in our country now. And I think that's because they were closer to the land and probably they ate better food. And so, as we now know, uh, the Brexit impact, or one of the Brexit impacts, is to uh, cause a lot of economic migrant workers to think twice about coming here. And I would imagine that our government will have to make arrangements to um, stop them from uh, giving up on us, because otherwise, uh, ironically, uh, the harvesting and processing of much the food that we eat in our kind of arrogance in this country is entirely made possible by those people who still know how to work physically and who are fitter and probably happier as a result, although they are aspiring to our Western lifestyles and they'll end up in offices feeling miserable. And in, in terms of animal welfare and, and abattoirs, I think there's a there was a fascinating investigation done by the, the Guardian and by the, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism that, that saw that the kind of uh, concentrated animal feeding operations that you typically see in, in in North America and the United States have have have, have been have come to Britain essentially that there is yeah. nearly 800 livestock mega farms and and so I wanted to yeah hear your opinion on on, on this and and how especially with the Defra paper being so optimistic on animal welfare and and kind of Britain leading animal welfare standards uh, in the European Union and abroad I mean what 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 could we see here. Well, yes, I mean, there's, a lot, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, regarding the Guardian article, which basically said intensive feedlot beef has come, has come to Britain or is coming to Britain, I think that is a very significant exaggeration. There are a growing number of um, finishing units for beef cattle, which are not unlike US feedlots. And I think that is a worry. But the vast majority of finished beef animals in this country come from a grass-fed or mainly grass-fed um, system. And one of the ironies about the article in The Guardian, which was written by Felicity Lawrence, is that it may have the uh, consequence of accelerating the move away from red meat consumption amongst young people, which I think is a disaster, um, uh, because not only is most of the red meat that this country produces uh, mainly grass-fed, as I just said, but also um, 70%, 70% of our farmed land is is in grass. So if a whole generation of young people give up eating beef and lamb, uh, then it's bad for uh, the future of farming, not least because we need to save the carbon stocks that are in the soil. Uh, and if you plough up grass and to grow vegetables, if you want to be a vegan or a vegetarian, that's going to release an enormous amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Obviously, I'm not in favour of um, in industrial livestock production or intensive beef, but I think we, all of us, 
have to become much more sophisticated in differentiating between the intensive and industrially fed chickens and pigs and dairy cows and very small percentage beef, which are part of the problem, and the mainly grass-fed and sustainably fed lambs, beef, dairy cows like mine, and where they exist, the chickens and pigs, which are part of the solution. And we need to be expert in that because we are hopefully about to undergo a great transition towards more sustainable food systems and sustainably managed livestock will play a very central part of that transition. Regarding abattoirs, uh, there's been a terrible concentration of abattoirs amongst, you know, and a reduction of all the small abattoirs and a concentration of the slaughter of most farm animals uh, to a very, very few huge industrial scale abattoirs, often operated by migrant workers like this one down the road from us in Clannabother in West Wales, which kills all the lamb for Sainsbury's. But it is a, an abattoir which really, I think, shouldn't exist because I was just up in the north of England last week and um, the farmer who, who I visited is sending all his lambs to West Wales to be killed. And that's not unusual. Most of the um, supermarkets now have one abattoir for each species or maybe two at the most. So there is a very unacceptable welfare burden resulting from these industrial abattoirs. And it's something that the Sustainable Food Trust is working hard on to try to reverse. We think that a switch to transitional a transition to sustainable food systems will need a very large number of new small and regional abattoirs. And at the moment, the trends are going in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. I, I saw as well, and, and something that I found really fascinating that you you mentioned in your uh, response to the, the DEFRA paper was that potentially uh, one of the ways going forward could be that each farmer would be required to complete a, an annual sustainability assessment for eligibility uh, of, of, of all sorts of public support. Could you elaborate a little bit more on, on that idea and what that would entail? Yes. Um, I'm uh, as an organic farmer, I'm obviously annually audited, certified by the Soil Association, both my farm and also a cheese making operation. But I'm also or we are also subjected to three or four other audits. Um, the Red Tractor Scheme, which is a sort of baseline scheme, really. And the Welsh Assembly Government require a lot of data from us in order to justify us receiving our single farm payment the Pillar 1 payment and the stewardship schemes that we're involved with. And then we also have a, another retail audit um, for our cheese making. So we have four or five audits a year. All of them take a lot of time, are expensive and frustrating. And yet many of them require overlapping data, not exactly the same data or categories of data, but very similar. So in my role as a sustainable Food Trust executive, uh, we thought, why not convene a group of farmers and land managers who are having similar experiences of multiple audits and see if we could encourage a shift towards one harmonised framework for auditing the sustainability of all farms and suggest to DEFRA that that would be the best way for them to go about reallocating post-Brexit farm support. So imagine that if Michael Gove was to buy into this, which we think he will, um, he was to say, right, after Brexit, you can only get money from the public purse if you subject yourself to an annual farm audit using a harmonised common framework of categories, let's say 10, um, that's our suggestion. Um, each category would have metrics uh, where we would supply data, for instance, let's take soil, uh, there would be maybe half a dozen or so metrics for soil data that we would supply, including organic matter, maybe an earthworm count. And they would be proxies, if you like, for the state of fertility of the soil on this farm. And then DEFRA would be able to award me payments uh, if I qualified for them, uh, for soil carbon stewardship, or maybe for other forms of support which are in the public interest. And Def DEFRA would then be able to monitor my farm each year or every time I submitted a return and assess whether the impact of these uh, subsidies or uh, grant payment schemes uh, was delivering and 
uh, this would be important, actually, because if you're going to be a government minister spending money on incentivizing farmers to do green things, then you've obviously got to be accountable for the expenditure. And just one example of that, if every farm did undertake this annual survey, and one of the categories was biodiversity, uh, the Secretary of State for Agriculture could um, announce annually a, biodiver a farm biodiversity index, whereby the, um, the results of all the farm surveys could be uh, put all together and you'd be able to assess whether the impact of the farming system as a whole was positive for birds, uh, for uh, wildflowers, and for anything else you wanted to measure. So we think that it would be in the national interest, but also actually in the interest of all farmers internationally, to have a harmonised framework for sustainability assessment in just the same way that we have one for accounts. So, you know, whether whether you have one accountant or auditor or another, you're still using the same common framework for doing your, and handing in your annual profit and loss accounts. And we could do the same thing for sustainability. I think we're making progress on this. It's quite exciting. I definitely think they're, they're great ideas. And as, as someone, as you know, that's, you know, I'm, I'm based in Paris here. I can't help but wonder, and as you briefly alluded to, what this might you know, what the implications might be internationally. So I'm thinking here specifically about the EU and, and you know, the reform around the common agricultural policy. What do you think uh, the EU could learn from, from Brexit and from the new ideas uh, from an agricultural perspective coming out of Brexit? Well, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I think there are huge opportunities emerging in the further CAP reform process Um I was in this at the Stockholm Eat conference the week before last, and there's a chap there called David Bulldog speaking, who's one of the kind of insiders in the EU policy world, and he said that the the next round of cat reform is likely to encourage a degree of um, subsidiarity and decentralisation of um, allocation of funds for sustainable farm management and each member state would have the opportunity to come up with their own package but of course in doing so they'll need to measure the impact of any incentives and disincentives they uh, they, they introduce and uh, this uh, harmonized sustainability assessment framework would have tremendous application there and it would also enable member states to compare between themselves at a farm up level about outcomes. So I think it, it has huge international application. And I think that although um, it may be that the uh, commissioner and the other EU officials are feeling not a little frustrated about the way the UK has behaved, and I don't blame them, uh, it may well be that some, because we have Michael Gove at the helm at the moment, it may be that some of the measures that he introduces could have application within the European Union as well. Patrick, you've been very generous with your time. Just a, a final, final question. You're optimistic uh, in some respects. Uh, you were maybe a little nervous or cautious um, in other respects. All in all, going forward, what would be your general assessment of where we are today with Brexit and agriculture and, and, and how do you feel going forward? Well, you know, if I have... Um, communicated some optimism, I should perhaps sort of temper that a little bit by saying that I think we are in kind of the last chance saloon mm -hmm. in terms of the impact of our farming, current farming and food systems on the planet. Um, I sign up to the um, analysis that Johan Rockström, Professor Johan Rockström made about planetary boundaries. And it's very clear at the moment that our farming systems are exceeding several of the most critical plan, uh, planetary boundaries, uh, namely greenhouse gas emissions, uh, nitrogen fertilizer or nitrogen generally, um, biodiversity, water extraction, uh, impact on soil fertility, to name a few. And that unless we transform our food and farming systems uh, in pretty short order, Rockstrom thinks by 2050 at the latest, we won't have a planet that is fit to inhabit. So, that needs to be a cause of enormous concern. But on the other hand, it could be a cause for optimism, because after all, um, 
the fact that we have no choice but to transform our food systems could concentrate the minds of policymakers and citizens alike. And I do think this is, you know, to quote Michael Gove, a kind of unfrozen moment when the conditions for change are as good as they've been for decades. Patrick, thank you very much. That is it for now, guys. As always, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by subscribing via iTunes, by rating and reviewing the show via iTunes. You can find, stream, and listen to the podcast on all of your favorite podcast apps, or you can go directly to our website, that's www.forfoodsake.me, and stream them directly from there. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The social media handle for all those platforms is For Food's Sake Me. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.